Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haramai, and welcome to the Niche Cast. We're recording this on the 18th of June, Tuesday, and we are here to do what we always do, chat about our Aotearoa sport. We love our sport, and we love our Aotearoa, and that's just how we operate. We've got some flying Kiwis transfer news. we got some Black Caps leftover things from the T20 World Cup. Big congratulations to the Black Caps. You beat... Uganda and Papua New Guinea, awesome. Congratulations to you. Really, really went above and beyond bucking the trend of bad preparation, iffy selections, and just a whole lot of goofiness. You really toiled hard against adversity to get the dubs there against Uganda and Papua New Guinea. So shout out to the Black Caps. Shout out to Kane Williamson behind me. Looking rather glum. But I bet I bet Kane Williamson and the Black Caps are really chuffed with their performance against Papua New Guinea. Shout out to them. So we'll be talking some wash up from the T20 World Cup. I didn't actually watch either of those games, so I can't talk about what happened against Uganda and Papua New Guinea. Fully tapped out of the T20 World Cup. But we do have some little bit of an angle to discuss there with the Black Caps and also got the Warriors. They lost to the Storm. So we'll chat through the Warriors stuff and a whole lot of Kiwi NRL Warriors Pipeline Junior stuff as well. Got a tall black squad that has been finalized to defeat Luka Doncic and Giannis Antetokounmpo in Olympic qualifying. So we'll be breaking that down. And we've uh, got our weekly tap-in with NBL Basketball, which got pretty funky. There was that uh, Wellington Saints loss to the Franklin Bulls, which is your background image there. Liafa just went Burko. And uh, I think the Bulls actually got the one, the win, sorry. They did, they, the overtime win. Bang. Exciting basketball. And we are here to chat through it. We are from the niche-cache.com, where you can have a little read if you're, if you're up if your reading skills are good enough, you can have a read about Aotearoa sport. We've got lots of breakdowns on our website. Black caps, white ferns, tall blacks, all whites. Crikey Jack, haven't even mentioned the all whites. They are preparing to start their Oceania Nations Cup campaign. Who are they playing first up? I think it's tomorrow. It's this afternoon. They're playing against the Solomon Islands. So that... Um... That might be one we end up parking. Maybe we'll come back for a couple of notes in the subscriber pod or something like that. But yeah, they're playing Solomon Islands at 4 p.m. today. So probably before the podcast comes out. Yeah, so we will update that stuff on the subscriber podcast, which we're probably going to record on Thursday. For those who don't know, the subscriber podcast is our bonus podcast for the Patreon Fano and those with a paid Substack subscription. It's our second podcast every week, strictly a little VIP section for the generous folks funding our mahi at the niche cache. What do we do on the subscriber podcast? We talk about Aotearoa sport again later in the week. So we leave space for stuff like the All Whites at the Nations Cup, Kiwi NRL team list, Warriors versus Titans preview. And who knows what else will pop up between now and then. As I said, that is strictly for the Patreon Fano and those with a paid Substack subscription. You can join the Patreon Fano to support our uh, coverage of Aotearoa sport. All channels, you can support it straight up the guts through Patreon. You can also sign up to our free newsletter, which goes out every Monday and Friday evening full of, guess what? Aotearoa sporting information. That is free, Monday and Friday via Substack. All the links are where they need to be so you can find them. And through a free newsletter subscription, you can upgrade to a paid subscription, access the subscriber podcast, and generally help us out. If you don't want to do either of those things, but you want to make a donation, you can hit, up, hit us up on Buy Me A Coffee as well. Otherwise, honkadori. We're out here doing our best. Hope you're doing your best as well. We're just here to chew the fat, spin a yarn, have a bit of fun discussing Aotearoa sport. 
And we always start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness. What do you got, old mate? Well, how about a shot here from Mr. Shinru Suzuki saying that you should rather be grateful for the weeds you have in your mind because eventually they will enrich your practice. <laughs> Crikey, Jack. Pedals are opportunities, you know? Your mindfulness always hits the spot and there's been all sorts of weeds in my mind and you kind of, I don't know, when you're on that journey of just trying to be a better human, be the best that you can be, have a bit of fun, be happy, be grateful, you're doing everything right, you're trying your best, and then these weeds just appear in your mind. You're like, I don't know, there's tools that act like weed spray, hopefully some organic weed spray so you're not killing yourself, not killing everything else as well. You got those tools, and you can give the weeds a little spray, and what happens? They pop up again next week. <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, you're back. You're back pestering, pestering my garden, the garden of my mind. But I guess that's the journey, right? You just got to keep uh, overcoming those weeds. You got to turn those weeds into flowers. How about that? Well, the metaphor works well here, eh? Because if you have ever tried actually weeding a literal garden and then like a week later it rains and it's back worse than it was before and you spent all morning, like if you wasted it, not wasted, but you spent an entire Saturday morning or something like this, digging all this stuff out. And then very soon it doesn't look like you've done anything, but of course you have done something because if you hadn't dug it out, it wouldn't be coming back the same as it was before. It'd be coming back much worse because you'd be adding to the problems. You, know, you just got to, I don't know, I, I guess assuming that the metaphor carries on the, the whole way through with the with gardening you just got to keep going and i guess with life you just got to keep going you to dig them out every now and then except they're going to grow back but you just got to stay on top of it don't you you can't you can't remove it you can't prevent it Either the weeds are going to grow one way or another you just got to try to stay on top of the problem this is a timely anecdote because the first episode of season two of house of the dragon just dropped yesterday and i am reminded about uh old georgie georgie double r martin and he describes his his mahi as a he's a gardener he's a gardener rather than an architect so he's always in the garden he's always tinkering he's always pulling out weeds he's always trimming this chopping that organizing this he's adding this there putting this there he's always in the garden he's a gardener as opposed to an architect just drop the plans away we go stick to the plans change the plans but it's all about the plans so i thought that is that applies here as well when it comes to your mind and your well-being and your mindfulness and your just trying to be the best you can be i prefer the gardening style the organic style, yeah, versus the, um, the I, don't, I don't know, I guess inorganic. <laughs> I guess inorganic is the opposite of organic. So, you know, and, and I guess if you think about it, like if your garden is overgrown with weeds, well, you've got some fertile soil, don't you? So there is there is positives to be seen if the weeds are growing, or you can probably grow a whole bunch of other stuff as well. More favorable stuff. While we're going down this the tangent... The strawberry patch will go well, you know? <laughs> yeah, while we're going down this tangent, and shout out to the other patches, the mushroom patch, the, the vitamin the... patch, and all the other um, organic matters that help us survive and thrive. If, you're, if your garden's messy, you're not going to see the weeds. So if your mind... Like, you're not going to see the weeds if you haven't actually done the work to organize your mind, be aware of the positive thoughts, the negative thoughts, the gratitude, the anxiety, the stress, the peace. If you haven't done anything to better yourself and organize your mind, you're not going to see the weeds because the weeds are just growing in a jungle, in an overrun garden, and then your mind becomes the overrun garden where you've got no idea what weeds are growing in your mind. Yeah, and I guess if you can't identify them either, you, have, you won't know the difference between a plant and a weed. Well, I guess they're all plants, aren't they? It's just 
those are our own distinctions as to saying this one should be there and this one shouldn't be there. Therefore, this one must be a weed. Um, stuff that's grown deliberately and stuff that's grown uh, on its own maybe is the better way to put that. But you know, yeah, I, this is a this is a deep metaphor. It runs a long way, doesn't it? The little bit of music without preparation didn't throw this to you at before the show, but I do have some music. You can throw out some music if you want to as well. We've got a new project from No Worries, Anderson Park, and Knowledge. So they've got a new project called Why Lord, which is a follow-up from Yes Lord from a few years ago. Typically awesome. Knowledge is awesome. Anderson Park's pretty awesome as well. So that's cool. And there's also the Muck Homie project. I put this song in the newsletter yesterday. So if you sign up to the newsletter, not only are you getting thousands of words about New Zealand sport, you get a couple of bangers every newsletter as well because we like our music. And the um, Muck Homie song, Sur le Pont d'Avignon, is pretty catchy. If you can't speak French, all good. Because you're going to be humming along in French to the, uh, I guess they call it a hook. So give that a jam. And also make sure you check out Christophe Altruento, Dubs from the Neighborhood. That still goes hard as a mofo. And if you're looking for some old school jams, I was just listening to Red Man, Blow Your Mind which is apparently from his 1992 album, What The. And always cool to go check out some old school jams. And that just sparked up a desire in my mind to check out some Red Man, some old school Red Man as well. You got any uh, musical selection you want to throw out? Uh, yeah, well, sneaking in under the radar on the... Um... On the last album stuke box that we did a week or two ago was an album called Bite Down by an artist called Rosali, who I had heard good things about this album, had not listened to it. It had been out a couple months by that point. Finally got around to it. Very much felt like a follow-on from that that uh the Waxahachie album that I absolutely adored earlier in the year as well. It's sort of um uh G records with a band that's a lot of david nance's band and i david nance and mode sound who also had a great album coming out earlier this year which sounded a lot like just kind of um bunch of 70s dudes hanging in a garage making just cool rock music and this follows on from that mixed with the sort of um americana songwriting styles uh, so that one caught me by surprise how much i actually really loved it and the more I listened to it, the more I enjoyed it as well. And I haven't heard this one yet, but I have been anticipating it for multiple months. The new Earth Tongue album came out over the weekend, so I will be getting to that pretty much as soon as I can uh, clear the traffic on my headphones. Once I get the um, once I get the podcast edited, I will be all over that Earth Tongue album. I've been waiting for that one for quite a while. Singles have been fantastic. Even the music videos have been fantastic with like sort of uh, weird occulty imagery stuff going on, making it sort of look like a, um Italian horror film from, from the 70s. So yeah, very excited for that Earth Tongue. I will be all over that in roughly several hours. That's not very rough, but you know. What's the all white? Oh, that'll be my soundtrack to the all whites game, I think. Maybe you're not going to give the old Oceania Nations Cup commentary a, a jam. Uh, no, well, maybe maybe I'll have it on the background. You know, we'll see That's how it goes. Roughly. I'm sure there'll be some dedicated football fans. And that clip, like you shared a Alex Paulson uh goalkeeping clip from some underage tournament might have been under 17s yes yeah under 16s but leading to, into the under 17 world cup um that would have been 2019 something like that i'm not sure exactly when it was but yeah when he was that age basically so from about four or five years ago it was the first it was him saving a penalty against same two penalties one in regulation time and then one in the penalty shootout later on against the solomon islands uh to qualify well they would have 
they would have qualified anyway because that was the first year where they gave two under 17 World Cup spots to Oceania. So by making the final, they'd already gone that far. But um, yeah, that was the first instance when Alex Paulson kind of became like a, a top prospect, nationally renowned for the for the people that were paying attention. And ever since then, the uh he's just the the cool thing about that clip is that you see a dude who's doing the same stuff that he's made his trademark ever since like is it's not needed to be he's gotten better at all his main skills but from that moment as like a 15 16 year old you could see a guy who loved a big moment um great leader he was good on his feet although he did make a mistake that i think led to the, one of the penalties that they conceded there but also more than anything He's been saving penalties from day one. And I don't know if this is what you're going to lead to, but that game was in the Solomon Islands against the Solomon Islands. And there were 12,000 people there cheering on for the Solomon Islands, like filing up all the way through the banks. It's not a stadium that would normally hold 12. Like they did not have 12,000 seats in that stadium, but they had 12,000 people standing, sitting, crowding, whatever, just to, to cheer on their team there. So the atmosphere at those, um, at those Oceania tournaments particularly for those host nations. And we do have the host nation Vanuatu in our group. They beat Solomon Islands 1-0 in the in the first round of fixtures. We didn't play because New Caledonia dropped out of the tournament for obvious geopolitical reasons, if you if you watch the news. Um but yeah, that's those atmospheres are pretty cool. And the all whites are walking into that. It's always nice to sort of touch base with the confederation that you're from. You know, not to get to feeling like the All-Whites are too good for Oceania, even though football-wise, yeah, technically they are. But it's it's important to stay aware of that stuff so you can be, I don't know, grounded in your um, grounded in your, your footballing heritage. I actually think New Zealand sport needs to do a lot more. Because when you like Fiji and Drua, my favorite super rugby team, the crowds in Fiji are absolutely bonkers. But there needs to be a whole lot more involvement with those Pacific Islands and their love of the same sports we love, which it would be rude for me not to mention at this stage, because I'm going to talk about them later on in the podcast, but Motu Pasikala, New Zealand, New Zealand Warriors youngster, scored two tries in New South Wales Cup. To the best of my knowledge and the best of our knowledge, Motu Pasikala also played football for Tonga. So we've talked about that before. Um, there seems to be crossover with the birth dates. Born in 2005, he's got multiple football profiles, as well as a whole history of playing rugby in Tonga as well before he came to Aotearoa. So he, so he just seems like the man. And we'll talk about him in a jiffy. But he... I, by the looks of it, he played under-19 football for Tonga. And this is... Obviously, there's a few assumptions here. and like Because it's there's a Motu Pasikala who played both. So I'm kind of connecting the dots. But speaking of crowds, I'm curious. The Wellington Phoenix finals game in Wellington, the glorious yellow arena that is otherwise known as the cake tin i i need your confirmation here because to the best of my memory the stadium was full and there were no closed off sections there were no yellow seats for that finals game is that correct yeah capacity thirty four thousand, give or take you know uh, probably a couple hundred for however many corporates turned up or whatever but yeah that was a, a full-on sellout i did not see i saw a lot of yellow they weren't necessarily yellow seats things a lot of yellow phoenix jerseys um might have been some empty seats for the concession stand lines before and after half time but it was by all reports a, a complete sellout i was watching the super rugby finals game in wellington rugby union the biggest sport in new zealand finals game super rugby i actually don't mind high level rugby union like it's all good especially super rugby finals it's entertaining it's fun to watch especially when you got wallace satiti just going absolutely bonkers number eight for the chiefs 
So actually, he he went to De La Salle College as well, and there's a whole group of uh, rugby league juniors, Kiwi NRL juniors, coming out of De La Salle College. FYI, but I was watching that Hurricanes game against the Chiefs, two New Zealand teams playing Super Rugby Finals in Wellington, and there's sections of the Caketon that are closed off. Now, we've been on this beat all year. Because there's sections of Eden Park when the Blues are playing a Super Rugby Finals game that are also closed off. And we've talked about like the Warriors versus Storm. Cold, wet, Saturday night. What do we have? As usual, folks are sitting on the stairs. There's no section of Mount Smart that is closed off. But in a direct comparison, same stadium, same town. Two different sports, same finals stage of their respective seasons. The Wellington Phoenix fill up the Caketon. Meanwhile, the Hurricanes cannot fill up the Caketon. I was, I was like, oh, what do I spot there? I see a big block of yellow seats. I don't remember that being there for the Wellington Phoenix. I just thought uh, this is a nice little update to our ongoing coverage of Kiwi sports fandom. Yep, those those Phoenix crowds took a little while to get there, though they they would have liked a couple of those during the regular season. But, but I don't um... like I don't think there's much difference between the Phoenix regular season and the Hurricanes regular season. Like the Hurricanes regular season games, there were still large patches of the Caketon that were bright yellow for the seats, not for the jerseys. But that's why the final stage is really important. That finals comparison, same stadium, same stage of the season. I don't think there's the same hype, to be honest. Like the hype around the Wellington Phoenix was far more than the Hurricanes. And the Phoenix fans showed out in force to sell that out and to fill that stadium. And that's not happening for the Hurricanes. And to be honest, it's not happening for any Super Rugby team because the Crusaders weren't winning, so they're not commanding a, a sellout kind of audience either. Yeah, and remember that was the biggest crowd, that Phoenix crowd was the biggest crowd of the entire A-League season. And I'd be curious to know if there was a Super Rugby game that would rival it. It could really only be the Blues at Eden Park that, that would, um, which is where the final is this week isn't it i think it's blues chiefs so maybe that one will, will tip it over but that's in a much bigger city with a bigger stadium so that's not quite uh, you know that's that's not the exact comparison we're talking about but i'd be yeah be curious to know how many super rugby games at any point of the season have challenged that phoenix crowd and that like yeah sure the eden park crowd blues chiefs final it's going to be a massive crowd as it should be like Kiwis love their sport and they're going to show out. Still think you're going to have sections of Eden Park that are closed off, you know? Like that's still going to happen and that doesn't happen for the Warriors and it didn't happen for the Wellington Phoenix in their A-League final. Just prior to recording, we had a bit of news come through the wire that the one and only also, Marco Stamenich, he apparently is going to sign, well, here's the, uh, the, the direct quote from the Forest Review. Nottingham Forest close to signing New Zealand international Marco Stamenich for £4.6 pound, million pounds from Red Star Belgrade. He is expected to go on loan initially to Olympiacos. We... We're preparing for Marco Stamenich to sign somewhere. And it seemed like uh, Coventry, I don't know the official name for them, Coventry FC, Coventry United. Coventry City, I think. Coventry. The geezers from Coventry, they were going to sign Marco Stamenich, but Coventry in the second, are they in the championship or are they in the third tier of England? Yeah, English Championship, so second tier of, of English football. So below the Premier Premier League. So that's, that uh, seemed like that deal was going to happen. 
but there wasn't any confirmation. And you're kind of on top of this. You're pointing out that this had been uh, suggested here, but hadn't been suggested there. Now we've got Nottingham Forest coming into the mix to sign Marco Stamenich. But a key detail here is that he's going to be loaned out to Olympiacos. So can you break down this move, but specifically the loan section of the deal? Yeah, right. Because like, Marco Stamenich signed with Red Star Belgrade, aka Sir Venice Vesta, um, on a free transfer 12 months ago. Like it wasn't, and, and I don't think this is a transfer he necessarily had in mind. I don't think he was expecting just to be one and done in Serbia. I think he actually was sort of setting up for a few years there, perhaps. But Red Star got an offer from Coventry that they felt was like too good to refuse, even though arguably if they hung around another year, you might be able to double that money. I don't know. But um, yeah, there's there's always financial implications and, and squad building implications and whatever. And Stamenich was an important player for them, but I wouldn't say he was one of their best players, one of their crucial key can't do without him kind of players. He he had some spells out of the starting lineup during the season. So um just a yeah, an offer they felt they couldn't refuse, but there was there were hints from the very start that Stamenich was a little bit um you know reticent about it. That that he first wasn't sure if he wanted to move at all and then ultimately decided he probably would, but then from because the Coventry side of it they kept saying they kept sort of pouring water on it saying like yeah there's talk like the Coventry media basically the the reports that were getting through to them was a lot of like yeah there's 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 chat there's definite um negotiations but nothing's been signed nothing's been confirmed whereas the Serbians like his coach and the technical director or, or someone like that at at Red Star were just straight up talking to the media openly about how the transfer has already happened and they wish him luck. They think he'll be able to walk straight into the team and and uh, and play well at that level and blah, blah, blah. But I was prepared all of last week for a confirmation that never happened. So in hindsight, maybe that was a clue. I think the fact that this, se this seemingly dumb deal, done deal was dragging on the way that it was, maybe it wasn't quite as done as suggested. Um, from what they've said in Serbia today, that like the clubs had agreed, like that was all signed. It was just a matter of personal terms, and and Stamenic wanted to aim Premier League rather than Championship, if possible. And I don't know whether he held out and then Nottingham Forest came through, or if Nottingham Forest came through, which caused him to hold out on on the Coventry stuff. I guess maybe more likely the latter is that he he heard it of other interests from another club who were going to pay a similar, if not slightly improved transfer fee, in which case doesn't make a difference for Red Star, does it? You're getting the same money for the same player. I guess that's the more likely thing is that once that happened, he started to think, well, I kind of prefer this Nottingham Forest idea. The The boy Chris Wood maybe is putting a good word for me here or something like this. I don't know, but Sounds like now, like, that's what's going to happen is he's going to sign with Nottingham Forest, but Nottingham Forest have an ownership group that have a couple of other clubs that, that are involved with. So Olympiacos is one of those clubs, and it sounds like, yeah, loan them out to Olympiacos for the first season, and then see how it goes. Like, when if this gets, if and when this gets confirmed, we'll get more details about what that kind of thing looks like. But, yeah, if he goes to Olympiacos, it'll be like a... Um, well, it'll be one of two things. it would be, first of all, just development of saying, we don't know if you're quite ready for the Premier League, but we're going to put you at a club where we sort of have an idea of how these things translate because we also own that team. And Olympiacos, they finished third in the Greek League last year, but they won the Europa Conference League, which is the third tier continental competition. They won that. So they'll be Europa League team this season challenging for a greek title which means we're back on we're back on for the marco stamenic won a league and cup double in denmark won a league and cup double in serbia maybe next year he wins a league and cup double in greece and then perhaps the year after that he wins a league and cup double in england you know <laughs> who knows Nottingham forest winning the premier league is pretty hard to imagine but with chris wood and marco stamenic it could happen you know that's that might be the the, the tipping point for them but the other reason why they might be loaning into Olympiacos is that they have some mad financial fair play issues. And it might be that they're not like if they sign him 
but don't register him, that might be a little bit of a sneak around. You know what I mean? Like that might be that that transfer fee doesn't have to go on this year's um, books and Olympiacos can kind of like squeeze him and under the radar or, or however, I think that might also be a factor in this. So it might, it might also just simply be that it's hard. It's very hard for them to sign players full stop because they need, they absolutely need to be selling some guys to make some money because they were docked points last year and it nearly got them relegated. So there are some complications on the financial side of things from Nottingham Forest, but it seems like they've probably got a plan. And if this does go through, it will be two New Zealanders in the space of two weeks after Alex Paulson also signing with the Premier League club. So I, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't just write a big preview of this upcoming transfer window because I was uh, curious. I was did it because I genuinely feel like this is a big transfer window, which deserves to, you know, a little bit of focus to get people on their toes and ready for some of these kind of moves. Wasn't necessarily expecting this one, especially because I wasn't expecting him to go to Coventry anyway. And then once that was going to happen, I wasn't expecting him to suddenly not go to Coventry, go to Nottingham Forest and instead via Olympiacos. But here we go. It's just, uh, um, as, yes, as Fabriciano Romano would say, here we go. For the less footballing inclined of us, is Olympiacos like a, a middle, like are they the bridge between a team like red star and nottingham forest is it like is there a progression there where it goes red star olympiacos nottingham forest as far as the quality the level and just the all-round you know layout of european football because it seems like this is a nice little bridge to then step into the premier league if that's how it's going to play out I think it would be a bridge to step into Nottingham Forest specifically just because they would be able to monitor him with their own scouts and their own coaches and their own information and whatever. I don't necessarily know the standard as a as a leap up or it, it's probably a sideways move going from one of the going from the best team in Serbia to one of the best teams in in Greece. The fact that it's one of might might be beneficial in development though because it might it's, you know red star won a lot of games very easily because they're just the best team in serbia it will be more competitive for him in greece even if olympiakos maybe aren't as good as red star red star did play champions league last year he's not going to play champions league with olympiakos but he would play europa league with olympiakos so that's something beauty and there is there is some news as well with uh grace was newski newski she has signed with lexington which seems to be in the that must be in america i'd say yeah brand new league in america the usl super league so the usl sl <laughs> which they don't think very hard and long about their uh, acronyms in that country but yeah, they're, they're inventing this league to be sort of like a a second tier because the NWSL is there, the NWSL is very strong, but there's kind of nothing below it. So only the best players of what is a massive selection of players, specifically in their college system, most of them just finish college and then don't play football anymore or they go overseas. They're trying to sort of build a second tier to develop those players, possibly with progression to the NWSL in mind and yeah, that's that's what the USL Super League is. So Grace Wineski is playing in the well, she is off to play in the second tier of the United States competition in America. Macy Fraser is playing in the top tier, and she had her first start for the Utah Royals. What did you make of her performance there? I did see the clip of the uh, the coach chatting about macy fraser is she do you reckon macy fraser is just going to be starting lots of games now she's settled into a new team and just what did you make it like give us a scouting port macy fraser the the utah royals which almost made me burst out and singing lord royals because macy fraser is a royal you know i hadn't even clicked on that one yet it's that, that might be a reference that snakes its way into some of the writing at some point. Um, 
Just quickly on Grace Wisniewski, though, because she is, of course, coming back, should, should mention this, coming back from an ACL injury, um, which is not like a, you know, that's not really a career threatener at this point. That's just a common injury, which unfortunately a lot of women's footballers in particular have to miss nine to 12 months of their careers with every now and then. Um, so it's not like the recovery is an issue, especially when she's been recovering at the 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 you know the NZ Institute of Sport or whatever they call it, where the Wellington Phoenix have their base and the and the Hurricanes. You know they do actually share a bit of a um a, a training base there. Those two teams, even if they don't quite share the same fan base in, in the stands, but they yeah um that is a factor to say is she hasn't played a game since she blew a knee out in like the fourth game of the season, something like that for the Wellington Phoenix. So the um, Lexington something or others, whatever they're called, doing some nice business there. They've obviously done their scouting. They've obviously been well aware of uh, of who Grace Wisniewski is for a while if they're popping up before she's had a chance to prove her, uh, prove her fitness again. Not that I think that'll be an issue, but yeah, that is a, um, there is an interesting thing to see there because quite a few, this is a new league and quite a few A-League players mostly imports but not exclusively and Wisniewski is, is proof of that have been signing in this league including Hayley Davidson who is you know Wellington Phoenix import and Wellington Phoenix's imports were all sort of a um, few of them have played in Europe before one of them was Canadian not American one of them born in Florida but plays for um, Venezuela internationally but they're all sort of come through the the North American American kind of pathways and it does seem like this league is designed to house those players, which might mean the Wellington Phoenix is filling out their import spots in the future, looks a little bit different. If those types of players are no longer as available and you've got to dip a little bit lower down, you're always going to find some players who might play for slightly less because they want to experience the world though and you know want to live in New Zealand, which has a good reputation and stuff like this. So that will um, that is just something to think about with that. As for Macy Fraser, first start of her NWSL career, it was expansion side against expansion side. The Utah Royals are an older NWSL team, but they stopped existing. And then they've this year been reestablished. They're up against Bay FC, who are brand new. Um, Fraser's third appearance in, in the league. They said when she signed there that they were going to have give her like time to uh, acclimatize. You know, they're not going to rush into anything. Well, um, they just set her, settle into the team before, uh, you know, starting to worry about what it. Uh, what her role might look like on a match day. Well, the second game after she arrived in America, she was getting the debut off the bench, and then she played about 30 minutes the next game, and then she started the one after that. So there wasn't much acclimatization necessary. That might put in some perspective as well why she didn't go to the Football Ferns Tour last time. I think if she'd been rushed through by the Royals a little bit, it probably did make sense to stay back and train with the club at that point. Um, And I thought she looked really good. She She was doing a lot of Macy Fraser things. She was, she wants the ball under pressure. She knows how to turn. She knows how to play like little, um, maybe a one touch pass to, to the open player, or um, maybe you turn access the space and then switch it out to the other side or whatever. Like she, she makes good decisions like that. And it's often felt watching her play for the Wellington and Phoenix, like she was maybe a step or two ahead of her teammates. Like she was looking for her teammates to get into position that they weren't quite on the same wavelength because she's just thinking of the game a little bit quicker, which suggests a player who can scale up pretty pretty instantly to a higher level, because she's making decisions of a higher level player already. Um, and that was what you saw there. The physicality, I think, is the the obvious aspect, which is going to be, was, which will take longer to get used to, because she's not particularly big herself. She is very fit, but she did get absolutely shouldered off to the turf at one point by... Um, I think it was Rachel Kundanjani, who's one of the one of the big name signings up front for uh, for for Bay FC. Um, in fact, I think she might be the world record signing. Or she's one of the you know the Bay FC made a couple of big 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 money signings. Although so did Utah. You know they they, they brought in Macy Fraser, A League uh, record transfer fee. Not quite in the same ballpark as world record transfer fees, but still. Um, and there are other instances like where she she's so good at pressing, but then in the A-League where you press a player and they panic and you tackle them here, you press a player and they just drop a shoulder and turn past you and you run you run one way and they run the other way with the ball. Like there are 
several times where that did happen but she was getting stuck in and winning tackles in this game which she wasn't doing as much in the in the substitute appearances so you're already seeing her adjusting to the level pretty nicely and um i yeah i think you add all that together i expect her i expect to see macy fraser starting most games from this point onwards for the utah royals i don't think they spent that money to to sign a project player i think they spent that money because they thought here's someone who can make an impact from day one and the way she settled in this quickly suggests that she probably will of course the most important thing to say about that game is they won they they scored a very late goal um to beat bay fc 1-0 it was a free kick from the sideline that might have been headed in by the center back might have also been a known goal from one of the um one of the bay defenders if abio goal from a couple of weeks ago got overruled to be a known goal then i think this one is probably a known goal but we'll see how that goes it doesn't actually matter for utah they had scored one goal in five games were on a six game losing streak and hadn't won for 10 matches so they were very 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 distinctly bottom of the table looking a little bit like the um yeah, they're with a with a young team as well. I think there was only one player in the starting lineup of this match who was over the age of 25. So they're coming into this league with a new squad, mostly a young squad. They're losing a lot of games. Those things tend to go together. It actually felt a lot like the first year or two of the Wellington Phoenix, which are the year or two of the Wellington Phoenix that Macy Fraser was around for, but didn't play in the first team for for whatever reason. Um and she felt like she missed out while she's getting that experience now in the, in the NWSL, so there you go. But, yeah, she makes her first start. They snap a 10-game winless streak. They snap a six-game losing streak. They instantly look like a better team than what they were before, and that is more evidence to the point that Macy Fraser is hopefully going to continue to be an important player for them or grow into becoming an important player for them, at least, which is pretty massive for the football ferns because... For quite a while, almost all of our very best top-level players have been defenders and goalkeepers, and that that stacks up with the type of team that we've seen from the football firms over those years. Here we've got an attacking creative player, you know, an attacking midfielder, playing in the top league, well, one of the top leagues in the world, looking pretty good in her third appearance and first start, only going to get better from this point onwards. That is extremely exciting. I have the Lexington name here, and they are the Lexington yes. Sporting Club. So shout out okay. to the Lexington Sporting Club. Sounds like Club. a placeholder. <laughs> um, Lexington SC. SC, yeah. That's a very creative name for the Lexington Sporting Club. I'm curious because we are... There is a theme here today in our niche cast that it's just like we do this quite a lot to be honest of just celebrating the young talent from Aotearoa performing at a very high level we love the young talent it's not just like as you said macy fraser's a unique talent it's not like there's just oh there's so many of these youngsters no these youngsters are different gravy they've got something funky they've got unique skills they've got x factor marco staminich is there we've, we've talked marco staminich might be signing with the premier league club but going out on loan alex paulson's signed with the premier league club as well like this is the level of talent we have coming out of aotearoa in the youngster department macy fraser would you say a league record transfer fee for a youngster from aotearoa before we depart football realms can you throw a couple of names at me because every Monday you do your domestic football roundup, which you go deep into the local football scene, recapping the results and any little bits and pieces. Shout out to Dion Price and the uh, the goal showing was a goalkeeper just booting the ball downfield and he uh, put it in the back of the net. So shout out to that. My question though is like, drop a couple of names we need to note down. Like, with uh, Pia Vlock, Ella Jerez, those type of characters, supreme young footballing talents from Aotearoa. 
Is there anyone standing out right now who you've got your eye on as like, oh, this player in the domestic footballing circuit is making a few waves and they could be elevating to the A-League or the Flying Kiwis department in the coming years? Like, who do we need to know about so far this year from the local football circuit? Well, if you'd asked me at the very end of the last National League where I would watch things, you know, as as closely as I get with the domestic football stuff, I'd have pinpointed Liam Gillian from Auckland City, winger and uh, attacking midfielder from Eastern Suburbs, Lewis Toomey, both of whom, especially, I think Toomey probably has signed with Auckland FC. Liam Gillian's been rumoured. I don't know how much of that is real rumours and how much of that is me trying to talk it into an ex existence. Um but Gillian's been in fantastic form. He scored again on the weekend for Auckland City in their Chatham Cup win over Hamilton Wanderers. Certainly hasn't been playing much for Eastern Suburbs, which maybe that's a clue as well. You know, he I mean, might just be injured, or maybe it's a they're moving on a little bit from from that. Um, uh, was Vadim Petkovic, by the way, who was the Manurewa goalkeeper who scored that goal? That was in the 117th minute extra time Chatham Cup knockout game away from home against Auckland United. He just boots the ball downfield. You, this is on Friday night as well, so it's under the lights. Um, this is me putting, you know, given some uh, some respectful context to the Auckland United goalkeeper who got beaten by that, slipped over, and you know couldn't recover. There were some severe weather warnings on Friday night. There were big storms, so it was um, it was pouring with rain. It was dark. The lights were on. It was not. It was windy. It was not an easy uh, not an easy situation, but. A goalkeeper from his own box scored a 117th minute winner in a Chatham Cup game. That's that's pretty awesome. And consistent for the Chatham Cup, isn't it? Because Chatham Cup final last year it was it was Max Tommy who scored to to take the game to to a penalty shootout, I think it was, for for Melville United against Christchurch United, and then Christchurch United ended up winning anyway. Christchurch United have already been knocked out of the Chatham Cup this year, which is wild their man cashmere tech both got bounced in the previous round which was very unexpected but yeah uh in interesting times in there um and then on the women's side yeah ella jerez is definitely someone she's a little bit younger but she has now moved to the wellington phoenix reserves so working her way up there um the phoenix tends to do very well at scouting players from around the regions and and picking them up and putting them in their system and and whatnot. I I think that's I think probably the player I would have pinpointed at the end of the last National League season is someone who actually hasn't been playing domestic football recently, though. That's Lara Colpe from from Western Springs set up both goals, including one for Ella Jerez in the in the Cage Shepherd Cup final. But I, I was looking at this yesterday. I was a little bit of a side mission while I was doing that newsletter. Um, just wondering exactly. I, I realized I hadn't actually seen her in any team list for Western Springs this year. So I went looking for some evidence to see what I could find. And there was a match program online from their last home game of last season's National League where there was a feature on her saying farewell. She's off to to try her hand at getting a professional contract in Italy or Switzerland or somewhere around like in Italy and Switzerland. Like she was going on trials, I guess. So uh, Colpi is pretty short, but a very good work rate, a really clever passer, like someone who just has an incisive eye for a through ball and scores a few worldy goals too, knows how to curl one in the top corner. She had a fantastic National League last year, and it sounds like maybe she's already heavily on the mission for for trying to find a, a professional gig. Haven't couldn't find anything further on that. I don't know like what clubs are where or, or anything like that. Um, but maybe now that that the seasons in Italy and Switzerland have ended, maybe we might hear something more about that. Or maybe she just pops up at Western Springs and remains one of the best domestic players awaiting a a. Uh, a professional contract, which there will be an Auckland FC women's team next season. They're not do they're sort of doing it one team at a time, um, which is you know understandable if a little bit annoying that the women have to wait a little bit longer. But that is also another possibility to think about, like Auckland FC scooping up some of the best domestic players as they have been doing for their men's team. The same thing will happen with the women's team in twelve months. As we discussed earlier, the Black Caps were bounced out of the T20 World Cup. And this 
it sucked to be honest like <laughs> the whole the whole thing was just an absolute shambles we talked about it in our subscriber podcast last friday reacting to the loss against the west indies and i did a bit of a deep dive into everything that went wrong and everything that could go wrong did go wrong so i finished that with just like adjusting my perception of the black caps they're just they're just like mid mediocre chilling like i don't really feel any world-class elements of the black caps right now and you can look at this t20 world cup performance you can look at the fact that bangladesh south africa england and australia have all had test victories in new zealand in recent years we can look at the kiwi intangibles that we love about the black caps or that we loved about the black caps because they're no longer there the planning preparation tactics world-class fielding haven't seen it in recent weeks so i'm just chilling on the black caps the one thing i have been thinking a lot about and i want to make this crystal clear that and it's in tune with everything else we're saying in this podcast today things are about to get really 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 interesting because the youngsters are going to pipe up in the next year or so and as i'm pondering this and obviously i love the domestic cricket write and talk a lot about domestic cricket so i'm all over the the youngsters in aotearoa knowing what i know i find the perception of the black caps fascinating because everyone seems to be stuck in the past with the black caps and we've discussed this a lot so we don't necessarily need to go deep into this but like a few examples all the selection chat around this t20 world cup squad was about colin munro right last summer as the black caps were introducing young players everyone was having a cry about neil wagner what happened for the last t20 world cup they select the youngster in finellen ahead of martin guptill everyone's having a cry about martin guptill while those things are happening people are having a cry about the black caps being too old so you can't complain when the black caps select young players and also complain that the black caps are stale when there's too many players over the age of 30. So I was like, I think just a lot of people are stuck in the past about the Black Caps. And then you look at a lot of the international stories, it's all about the golden age, the golden era, the golden generation of New Zealand cricket. So all of this got me thinking, and I'm, I'm fascinated. Yeah, I think the best way to package this is intrigue. I'm fascinated by what happens next for the Black Caps, because I love the young talent and to be honest we've already got a young superstar in Rachin Ravindra we've already got a young superstar in Glenn Phillips Finn Allen's already there what happened last summer New Zealand home of the medium pacer home of the 130 kilometer swing bowler New Zealand gave test debuts to Ben Sears and willow rourke both of whom were bowling 140 k's everyone seems to have forgotten like what willow rourke did in his test appearance against australia he was hitting aussie batsmen on the gloves in a test aussie batsmen who they're brought up playing pace bowlers you know the bouncy wickets of australia they love the pull shot they love the fast bowling willow rourke war was hitting them on the gloves nipping the ball both ways 140 kilometers an hour ben sears is a psycho 
bowling 140 k's an hour. Cole Jamison's out injured, he doesn't bowl 140 kilometers an hour. Henry Shipley, he's out injured, he doesn't bowl 140 kilometers an hour. What are they? Two meters tall. New Zealand has this talent coming through. What happened? Just prior to the T20 World Cup, Tim Robinson, T20 debut. Who's he? The next best slugger. Finn Allen clone. We got two of them. Right there here. Mitch Hay. Next up, wicketkeeper. Averages. Oh, I need to get this correct. So I'm going to have a look. Mitchell Hay, Canterbury wicketkeeper, 23 years old. Averages 46 in first class cricket. And he's got a T20 strike rate of 149. Who is my favourite young cricketer? Well, there's got to be Zach Fox. The one and only Zach Fox. What does he do? He bowls hooping and swingers to right-handers. What did he do? What has he done? Multiple summers in a row. He's got out Sean Solia with the same delivery over and over again. He's got out Jeet Raval. Same delivery over and over again. Bowling outswing to the left-handers. And he's already played for the Black Caps. And he's played. He played in that Pakistan series. Dean Foxcroft played there. Addy Ashok barely played last summer. He's already played T20 international cricket. Josh Clarkson, Ben Lister. They're all there. Nathan Smith. Need I say more? What does Nathan Smith do? Dominates everything. What does Muhammad Abbas do? Enters domestic cricket, averaging over 40 straight away. Super Smash, whacking sixes, 360 degrees. Sixes over cover, sixes over cow corner. It's... All of which is to say I love the young talent coming out of Aotearoa. Forgive me if I've left anyone out there. These are just the names that come off the top of my head. Gareth Severin, Dale Phillips. Jock McKenzie. Crikey, Jack. Christian Clark, Matt Fisher. Curtis Heafy, Thorn Parks. All these dudes have spent the last two summers at least as some of the best domestic cricketers in New Zealand. Their stats, which isn't everything, but I mean, their stats are better than a lot of senior players. Like youngsters coming in averaging 40, averaging 50 with the bat, averaging 20 with the ball, averaging 19 with the ball. Stats aren't everything, so let's go to the eye test. Will O'Rourke nipping the ball both ways. Muhammad Abbas looking absolutely glorious, whacking boundaries. Tim Robinson effortlessly carving sixes over the offside. <sighs> Who's the best? New Zealand spinner at this T20 World Cup. Has there been a good New Zealand spinner at this T20 World Cup? Yeah, Tim Pringle. Bowling for the Netherlands. Oh, okay. You're right. You're actually right. Young lefty who's playing for the Netherlands. Shout out. But he's, he's a hearty Kiwi. So we need another spinner. Tim Pringle. Ashok. Right there. Like... The stocks in New Zealand cricket are better than ever. And to be honest, youngsters are already in the black caps, right? Like Ravindra's already there. Glenn Phillips is already there. Test debutant Seamers last summer. Ben Sears. Will O'Rourke. It's all there. I don't think this is the end. This is the end of one era. I have been thinking a lot. Like I kind of think the golden era is just starting. And if you put those players into a team, because like I don't see, I don't think Kane Williamson's going anywhere. That dude just seems to love cricket. I think he's just going to play a lot of cricket for a long time. So if you're putting these freaky young talents into a team that has mana with Kane Williamson and, and other key senior players, ooh wee, that is something to be very excited about. And we are going to see all of this play out over the next 
12 to 18 months, I believe. So yeah, let's take a break from the black caps, but let's do so knowing that there is some serious talent about to make waves. I mean, Glenn Phillips didn't make his test debut last summer because he played in Bangladesh, which wasn't in the summer, but he actually made his test debut a few years ago in Australia. What did he do? He scored a 50 in test debut right there, but he's only just entering consistent first 11 test cricket. So at every level, we've got youngsters shining. We've got youngsters who have stepped up into the Black Caps, Rajan Ravindra at the last T20 World Cup, Glenn Phillips stepping into the test team. Like, there's, for those who don't pay attention, youngsters are making T20 international debuts, ODI debuts every year for New Zealand. So every New Zealand team has been injected with young talent. Most recently, Tim Robinson, Zach Folks, Willow Rourke. But there's players who haven't even got into the New Zealand setup. But they have because they've played for New Zealand A. Mitch Hay, Muhammad Abbas, those type of characters. They're next up and they're ready to go. So this T20 World Cup sucked. It was all like, it just stunk. But now is not the time to be down in the dumps about what is happening with the Black Caps. Because if you're struggling, like Devin Conway, you're going to be replaced by someone better. And there is immense pressure on every single established black cap right now, given their T20 World Cup performances, to perform, taking wickets, scoring runs, because the youngsters are really, really good. And this isn't a long-term plan thing either. This isn't like a, um, what I mean is this isn't something that's going to take a few years to get the, the wheels in motion. This is already happening. Like this is the, the, the amount of those players that you listed there who have already played for the Black Caps and one, if not multiple for, well, like Rock's played all formats. Like he's 22. He's played every single format. I don't know how many players younger than him have, have managed to tick off the ODI T20 and test match boxes so quickly and i looked at his stats earlier like his worst average across the six so international the three and then the three at domestic level which also includes international but is the bulk of the domestic stuff his worst average is a shade over 26 in first class cricket like he, he just he takes wickets across all of them um I just looked at Tim Pringle's stats just for the curveball one there, and they did just quickly, and they they didn't separate his um, the last T20 World Cup from this T20 World Cup. So he's played ten World T20 matches, taken eight wickets at an average in the mid twenties and RPO under seven. So that's like that for a completely out of the box kind of selection is still really good. <laughs> that then that's for a Netherlands team where some of those are against like. Um, some of those are against sort of associate nations, but some of those are also against not associate, like test playing nations where Netherlands are expected to be big underdogs and he might be expected to just get like completely tonked around the park. Well, that clearly has not happened. Um, yeah, like Trent Bolt has said, he's not going to another T20 World Cup. He was kind of specific about that in a way which suggests that maybe he might be open to another ODI World Cup, which I think has probably been his best format um, across his career. But and I don't know that he's going to get another test match, unfortunately, which is annoying because I'd like to see him add to some of those numbers. But then at the same time, like they they said when there was an opportunity to pick him for a test match last summer, I think when Australia were here, and they sort of said like, well, He's not really playing any long-form cricket at the moment. So it's not so much that he's out of contention, it's that he's just not match fit for that many overs and that kind at that kind of level. So what happens instead is Willow Rourke and Ben Sears get those games against Australia and they take wickets and they look really good. And it's like, well, okay, I guess we didn't need to panic and select the old guy and and bring him back under under Dunn when like um even though playing underdone is a Black Caps tendency now, apparently that's not something they're worried about. But 
when it came down to that against Australia in the test matches, even though we lost those matches, there was a it was like it's lean on these two younger like Sears is older than you think. He's um twenty six or something like that. Willow Rock is only twenty two, so he's much fresher on the scene, but like inexperienced at that level doesn't matter. Talent's good enough. Like and the T twenty team has long been used as a as a um a sort of avenue to get guys the the bridge into international cricket and then they go on to play the other formats after that. Well that's not changing. Like we saw that in that in that squad that went to Pakistan not that long ago. Like this is just this is just uh I don't know. It's a uh, it's not even something that Black Caps necessarily uh, obviously they're aware of this with their selections. They've been targeting some of this stuff, but it kind of like the gardens we're talking about at the start, it has also happened organically because these players have just come through, done really well at every level, and you just have to pick them. And at some stage, spots open up and they get those opportunities and they do really well. Rajin Ravindra, big game Rajin. Like he comes in and dominated that last um, ODI World Cup. He scores a double hundred when he gets into the testing. Like he just seems to rise to every occasion. But that's not, it's a little bit of an anomaly, the extent to which he did that. But it's not an anomaly, the fact that a young Kiwi cricketer takes their opportunities, because that has been pretty consistent with a lot of these guys that we're talking about, and will probably continue to be that, because those opportunities are only going to get more regular at this point. Just to hammer home my point here, you might know of 22-year-old Central Districts all-rounder Will Clark, because we talked a lot of domestic cricket. I don't know if many Kiwi cricket fans or global cricket fans know Will Clark. Who's Will Clark? He's a 22-year-old who averages 43 in first-class cricket batting and 47 in one-day batting. He's an all-rounder, so he bowls as well. Good fielder. Last three scores of the summer, 44, 57, 66. Last game of Plunkett's Shield, he scored 66 and he took four wickets. Like this is the standard. This is someone no one really knows about, just casually averaging over 40 in first class and list a cricket to start their careers in a very established Central District Stags team. I could say the same thing, Curtis Heafy. Just scoring runs. Like this is this is what's happening. So I don't know. Got nothing else to say there. And we need to keep it moving. Because the New Zealand Warriors lost to the Melbourne Storm. There's a lot going on here. Primarily, I don't think the Warriors are very good in the rain. Like we've seen the Warriors lose in the rain a few times. I don't think the rain is conducive to Warriors footy. So just be wary if you're seeing rain on the forecast because... Especially when you're coming up against the Melbourne Storm and the Warriors are winning, then it starts raining, then Nelson Asafa Solomona comes on the field, Christian Welch comes on the field, and the game starts to change because the Warriors, they do have a bit of a smaller forward pack. Nelson Asafa Solomona, every time he gets the footy, he's running at Jackson Ford. And respect to Jackson Ford, he's pretty good, but Nelson Asafa Solomona is much bigger. And every time he ran at Jackson Ford, it looked like he was just bullying Jackson Ford. So I, I'm i definitely aware of the Warriors in the rain. I don't think that is something that is good for the Warriors because they do play a smaller forward pack and a lot of their execution, which is kind of shit this year compared to last year, they are trying to pass the ball. And passing the ball in the rain with all these decoys and the Warriors aren't really that good at decoy runners at the moment as well. It feels like every game the Warriors will leave a defender in the defense. Uh, sorry, they will leave a decoy runner in the defensive line. So it's like just a hunch. It feels like the Warriors have a disallowed, disallowed try for a obstruction every game. It's like surely. Just get your ass out of the defensive line, you know? Just run through. Don't stand in the middle of the defensive line because you do it every game. That is uh, another observation. 
but the all those decoy plays little shifts and all that stuff i don't think that's conducive to wet weather footy either so i'm kind of tracking that obviously we know the storm they usually win against the warriors and like part of me does want to highlight like yeah highlight frustration with the referees because i mean wade egan got smashed in the face and there was no penalty like that stuff's happening it's like what's happening here but then again as i've said a few times in these podcasts you make your own luck with the referees so if you're being dominated you're not going to win the penalties and that's where the wet weather footy coming up against the Sofa Salomona, Christian Welch, and so on. If they're winning that rugged battle of the middle, they're going to get the benefit of the calls. That's just how it is. So you make your own luck. Like, I don't see it too often where one team is dominating their opponent and they get no referee favors. That doesn't happen. <laughs> and it's... I think it's most prevalent in rugby and rugby union because that domination... Winning the physical battle means you're winning the ruck. And that determines the whole game. It determines the tempo of the game. It determines how the referee perceives the game. And if you're losing that physical battle, you're not getting any favors from the referee. The Warriors had a decent crack at that physical battle because they were putting shots on and that was fun to see. But they weren't necessarily controlling the ruck. It's one thing to put a shot on. It's another thing to win the tackle, lay all over the opposition and slow the play the ball down. A lot of times when you put a big shot on, the player just bounces off. You don't have that contact with them, so they get a quick play the ball. So say, like, you got the big shot, the crowd went, ooh, but then the opposition got a quick play the ball. So that something to watch out for in your rugby league viewing. In keeping with the theme of the podcast, I'm not sure if you saw this in the news yesterday, so you're either going to get this right straight off the bat, or you're going to have no idea. The New Zealand Warriors have lost seven games this season. How many games has Sean Johnson lost this season? Well, I did read the point, uh, the newsletter, so I do know the answer to this. I probably could have figured it out anyway, though, because they he missed about a month and they won like three or four games in a row without him. So I'm guessing he, well, I'm not guessing, but I, I know, but I would also be guessing all of them. He would have played in all seven of those losses. Sean Johnson has lost seven games this season, and Sean Johnson has lost five in a row as the starting halfback. I don't know if this is, like, if there's any bigger picture takeaway from Sean Johnson playing in every single Warriors loss this season. He does have three wins and a draw, so shout out to him. The Warriors, they've got that draw, so he played in that draw, but they also have six wins. So they got three wins without Sean Johnson. And he's played in every loss. And it didn't look great against the Storm. That, I think that uh, seven losses for Sean Johnson and seven losses for the Warriors, I do like keeping it simple because that is as I want that to be as dramatic as it seems. I don't think my my Sean Johnson storyline here as is as dramatic as it might seem, but it's a situation that the Warriors are dealing with. And the Warriors are now 12th in the NRL. The Dragons are better than the Warriors. Yep, they've both got one by each. The Dragons are 7-7, seven and seven. the Warriors are 6-1-7. The, the Cowboys, they sucked against the Warriors. But they're better than the Warriors. <laughs> the Bulldogs, they've had an extra bye. 
but they've got a seven and six record. So we have to come to grips with the reality of the Warriors right now and that they're not a top eight team and it's going to be pretty damn tricky for them to get into the top eight if we're being honest. They've got to win some games. <laughs> Something's got to change for the Warriors. And this is happening at a time when we just saw second tier Warriors teams win games. So like the Black Caps, like the young footballers, like everything else we're discussing at the Niche Cage, this is a very interesting time considering the Warriors youngsters got the job done and the senior players haven't got the job done, especially considering against the Storm, who made the errors? Toe Harris had a sloppy play the ball. Sean Johnson had a sloppy play the ball. Sean Johnson kicked dead. Tamari Martin had a kick out on the full. Marcelo Montoya got sinbinned. Dallin Watanese-Lesnia got sinbinned. Mitchell Barnett was good. And then right at the end, when the Warriors were trying to have a whiff of a comeback, he offloaded to the Storm. The players who made the errors against the Storm, most of them were the senior players. The players who are supposed to be the best players. And yet, not only did they hinder the Warriors' performance against the Storm, but that's come just after a period when we saw the second-tier Warriors win games and play pretty damn well. So I don't think like, this is confusing. It's weird. It's strange. But it's what's happening. And I there's a lot going on. Like, I... Uh, I don't think anyone can say what the best Warriors team is right now. Like, I don't think there is a clear consensus, specifically when considering that last week against the Cowboys, Tamita Martin was the halfback, Shans Nickel Clockstar was playing out on the right, and Chanel Harris Tavita was playing on the left. Against the Storm, Tamita Martin's the halfback which means Sean Johnson's just chilling out on the right edge and Nickel Clockstar moves from the right edge to the left edge. That is... But the Warriors... Like, yeah, sure, when you're changing players, you've got to change how you're, you're, you're playing. But if you just compare the games versus the Cowboys game and then the Storm game, the halves are playing completely different roles. That doesn't feel conducive with winning because your attacking structure changes. And right now, I don't see a clear identity in that Warriors attacking structure. We saw that last year with all the short passing, the shapes, the poking through the holes in the middle, Dallin Watani, Zelezniak scoring out wide. He's not really getting overlaps at this moment, this season. But the Warriors are doing all their shape just to get one-on-one. -on -one. And I've said how annoying that can be before. But like their attack doesn't feel as slick and as efficient, which shouldn't be a surprise when we've just had two weeks in which the Warriors played, which now Harris Tavita on the left edge, Nickel Clockstar on the right edge, Tamara Martin swinging first receiver both sides of the ruck. Suddenly the next week it's changed with Nickel Clockstar on the left edge, Sean Johnson out on the right edge. And as awesome as Tamara Martin's been as the halfback, I don't think leaving Sean Johnson out on the right edge is like, <laughs> like just seeing Sean Johnson chill out over there wasn't like, oh yeah, this is the best way to play rugby league. So, okay, he's injured. So they rushed him back for a smaller role. Cool. So you change the winning formula to rush Sean Johnson back? That doesn't seem like as useful as it could be. And just the general idea of Temaire Martin dictating the flow to Sean Johnson, that doesn't make a lot of sense either. So it's my point here is there's a lot going on. 
Like we don't know the best players in the spine. We don't know the best team. We don't know the best way to play rugby league for the Warriors. Because at the moment, the best way for the Warriors to play rugby league is to play their second string team and just have a crack. You can't really force that though, because that would mean Andrew Webster drops all the senior players. So the best, the, as I'm talking through this, the only way to get to the Warriors' best footy is to have injuries, suspensions, state of origin call-ups. Then we have to play the second tier team. Then we have a crack and we win games. Like all of it seems a bit messy. And a bit tricky, bit niggly, bit pesky. And to me, to be honest, it reflects where the Warriors are at right now. And where they're at right now is where they've been since 95. 12th. That's the, that's the fuddy. That's the fuddy of Warriors mediocrity. And as much as we loved last season, they're right back home where they've always been as we enter round... 16 and this week they play the titans i think that's a very winnable game what happened the last time they played the titans it was a very winnable game big moment anzac day mount smart titans win yeah i remember that one <laughs> if i remember rightly in that game as well the warriors scored a couple of early tries and it just looked like wow here we go uh, you know this is they finally recaptured last season this is this is what we've been waiting for. And then they stopped. Like they just kind of stopped stopped doing whatever it was that was that was working for them. Or maybe it's just the matter of the, the Titans had just had to grind through that first, you know, initial spell. And then once they started to get some ball in prominent positions, which always happens in league, and that's why you can't overreact to those early starts because one team hasn't even had a chance to attack yet. Well, you know, it's, 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 you haven't seen, um, you've only seen half of the game, basically, at that point. You've only seen half of the evidence as to what this game is going to be. Case in point, saw a lot of that on the weekend against the Storm, really, because the Warriors were 14 nil up after 18 minutes, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, 3,300 days or whatever it was, 15 losses in a row to the Storm, who cares? It's done, it's gone. It wasn't gone, though, because the Warriors, and the vibe I got from that is the Warriors had to, even with, because it's easy to complain about the refs afterwards, it kind of felt like at the start they were getting a lot of the calls, though, in that in that spell, and they were keeping the ball down in the Storm's territory, which was the main thing, is the Storm barely even had a chance to get over halfway. But the Warriors worked really hard to score those points. And then when the Storm got some favorable position around about the 20-minute mark, it just felt like they scored three tries on their first three possibilities of scoring tries. And that might suggest a bit of softness in the Warriors' defense that isn't normally there. It's normally the attack that struggles to convert things a little bit more than the defense being able to hold things out. But against the Storm, they just kind of got sliced. Like the Storm sat back, they waited, they conceded a bunch of points, they weren't in a good position where they wanted to be. But when the game started to swing back and gave them an opportunity, they capitalized immediately to be leading at half time despite the fact that meaning i think missed a couple kicks as well so it was like four tries to two at at half time and they had a six point lead something like that then they carried things on in the second half and a couple yellow cards happened and, and so it goes like i thought the sin bins were fine like it's montoya stopped a dude in a professional foul situation that's a that's an easy decision and what's nazi lesniak while it was probably accidental you're off your feet, swinging your arm, making contact to the head. Like, that's a very, very, very consistent ruling to put them in the bin for that. Like, it's just how they call the game these days. And you're kind of struggling against the Storm anyway when you've... Even when those two overlapped and for a while they had to go 13 against 11. Like, yeah, nah, it's, that's 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 difficult. And then you get into situations where there were some other you know, couple penalties that weren't called or whatever, but this is what you're saying. It's like the momentum was against the Warriors... They were getting dominated in ways that they didn't want to be dominated in. You never want to be dominated in any game in any area, but and then the calls started going against them. Like that's those things are connected. Those are very direct links between those factors. But it felt like the turning point of the game was where the 
um, to me anyway, was a lot earlier on. It's where the Warriors had a really good first 17, 18 minutes. But probably, it's weird to say this when you're 14-0 up, maybe didn't capitalize as much as they should have on that on that situation, or maybe it's just a matter of just how quickly it swung. When the Storm finally got some position, the Storm scored points straight away and got themselves right back in the game immediately. And I don't know that the Warriors ever entirely recovered from that is the weird thing. They certainly didn't get back anywhere near the control they had. That was unsustainable level of control in those first 18 minutes, but we didn't see that Warriors team again for the rest of the game. I think that what you're talking about is when Asafa Salamona and Christian Welch came on the field. I, you're probably right. Yeah. I didn't have the meteoric report, but that felt like when it started to really rain harder as well. But the the key thing is that, you know, you get these the cliche like, oh, you can't beat yourself, especially against the Storm, because the Storm aren't going to beat themselves. That's what we know. We've seen it for decades now. And then the Warriors are making all the errors. And what happens is a few of those kicking errors, like Tim, I think Timaida Martin kicks out of the full or that's from the Warrior, the, yeah, I think it's when he kicks out on the full or there's a penalty, then you get the Marcelo Montoya Sinbin. And I think it was the Marata Niakori or Jazz Tavanga, sorry, too many Jatiaro vitamins, so the memory's a bit foggy. But the... The Storm get a penalty on their try line. Then Dylan Walker, another senior player, for whatever reason, he finishes tackle by rolling the Storm player onto their head. Why? That happens. Then you get us another sin bin. Like it was, these are, these are like ridiculous errors. Like there's two sin bins are just dumb things to do. And these are senior players doing dumb things, mistakes, penalties, errors. It's senior players making these errors. And this is a very interesting time for the Warriors, like the Black Caps, like everyone else, because the second tier, the young players, have won games. They've stepped up. They provide the most uh, optimism and I think we so we've had Mitchell Barnett called into State of Origin, Kurt Capewell has been called into State of Origin, Watane Zelezniak suspended, so hopefully this is time for force change. Again, Andrew Webster's not dropping players, but the stars are aligning to shake things up as they may need to be. We've talked about it before, say it again, there's a distinct lack of speed in that Warriors team. No one in the Warriors team who played against the Storm is fast for their position. No one. So, <laughs> no one in the team, like, they're all faster than you and I, but they are not fast in the NRL. I think, do the Warriors have fast players? I think Tane Tuapiki's got a bit of zip. So when he's sniffing around the ball little half gap he boom he's through that half gap for a hooker paul roach has a bit of zip but he might be out injured at the moment moala graham telf has got a bit of speed we've seen him play pretty well in the nrl so there are some fast slash powerful players in the warriors and i say fast slash powerful because this young chap motu pasikala scored two tries on the weekend might have been Tongan age group football representative. He looks fast enough, but it's his balance and change of direction and power as he's running that really catches the attention. And the interesting thing here about the Warriors and the rise of Motu Pasikala is that right now he's the dude. Last year, it was Ali Leotawa. Earlier in the season, it was Sio Kali. I think Mawala Graham Talf has been, you know, he's just been simmering away at a higher level than what the other dudes have been at. But, like, as far as, like, ooh, who's that? So, you, like, Leotawa's out injured now, Sio Kali's out injured now, and Motu Pasikal has gone up from SG Ball to Jersey Flag 
to now shining in New South Wales Cup. So if we're talking about like really exciting Warriors Juniors, he wasn't in this mix two months ago. Two months ago it was Co Kelly. Six months ago it was Aulia Tawa. So like the Black Caps, like my iffy bit concern about the Warriors in the NRL as far as winning and losing games, like a bit down on them at the moment. But when you dig beneath the surface, there's a dude in Motu Pasikala who is someone who wasn't even on the radar a little while ago because another fantastic prospect was on the radar. And that fantastic prospect wasn't on the radar prior to that because Aulia Tao was on the radar. And it's the same thing with the forwards. Like Eddie Aramia started at centre again. Talked about him last week, playing edge, playing middle, playing centre in New South Wales Cup. Luke Hansen, former Panthers half, started the year in Jersey Flag. Now he's just getting consistent reps as halfback in New South Wales Cup. Dimitri Sifakul is back in the New South Wales Cup. He started at prop. And that New South Wales Cup forward pack had Sifakula, Bantiafoa, Halasima, Jacob Laban, and Keilani going. I mean, Sifakula, Halasima, Jacob Laban, take your pick on which one you think is the most NRL upside. Maybe even chuck in Eddie Aramia, who's playing centre, but he forecasts as a forward for the NRL team. And one last thing on that New South Wales Cup team, Rodney Tuipilotu Avea, he was playing New South Wales Cup this week. He scored a try, I think. And I believe he started the year in SG Ball. And what's he, what does he do? What's his like profile as a rugby league player? Same as all these other kids. Big, powerful, mobile, Good at rugby league. So there's a lot to be excited about with the Warriors junior team. Well, the New South Wales Cup team is a junior team. Because most weeks, the majority of that New South Wales Cup team are under 21s. And a decent selection started the year in SG Ball. And now that young Warriors New South Wales Cup team are up to 5th in New South Wales Cup. They were outside the top eight. They were outside finals footy a few weeks ago. Now they are up to fifth. They've got eight wins, one draw, five losses. They're three and one in their last four games. And they play the Dragons next, so it'll be an interesting little battle. Uh, Got to give credit to the, uh, the Tigers. They are... Last in the NRL. No, this oh, big credit to the Tigers. They are now second to last in the NRL. They've got a promotion. They had a buy, and the Titans are now last. So Warriors play the Titans this week. Tigers, Western Suburbs. They're still last in New South Wales Cup, but the Tigers Jersey Flag team had a win over the Warriors. So shout out to them in Jersey Flag. Congratulations. Yeah, good for them. So the NRL team beat the Titans as well, didn't they? So I guess is how they... Well, it would be the Titans that they've gone ahead of, uh, I guess. So yeah, that was sorry, a, the Tigers didn't, duel. Tigers didn't have a bye. They had the win over the Titans. That's correct, because who went crazy in that game? None other than... Just about to ask you about that. Keanu Kinney. That dude... The, mo the most impressive thing about Keanu Kinney is how tough he is. Because he always gets smashed. And he's really fast, so he's hard to tackle. But pfft, he's getting smashed, and he just keeps showing up. And I want to see Keanu Kinney win games of rugby league. With my Kiwi NRL hat on, I want to see him win this weekend. Because I just want to see him win games of rugby league. With my Warriors hat on, just chill out for a week. Don't win this game. But I want to see Keanu Kinney win games of rugby league because he makes me more of a Titans fan. I wanted the Titans to win that game over the Tigers. I got, 
not emotional, but I was like, oh, that's an that's an annoying loss to the to the Tigers. That's a bummer. Because I was frustrated that Keanu Kinney didn't win the game. He deserves to win games of NRL footy. And he is, if any New Zealand Rugby League fan, maybe you're a Samoan and you want to watch a young Samoan Kiwi shining, but you just need a, you just need someone new to really tune in with in the NRL. That's Keanu Kinney. That, that dude is fantastic. Any, uh, yep. Yeah, three offloads, three line breaks, one try assist, eight tackle breaks, three line break assists, 26 runs for 321 meters is what I've got written down here for uh, Keanu Kinney. He did make one error, just the one cheeky error. So, you know, and he's playing against the Warriors next week. So that is absolutely, uh, that that lines up with so many different things we've been talking about here. It's like a young Kiwi player who had, who, um, what we've talked about so many like emerging uh athletes and in, in this podcast we've also talked about the warriors lacking speed here's a really quick player they're going to be playing against talked about the warriors struggling for convincing results with their best dudes out there well here's a tricky game against the titans team that's already beaten them once this year and they've got an informed kiwi fullback running at them with their lack of speed to they didn't you know you mentioned um the the row played fullback for the storm on the weekend in our preview beforehand he made a he made a few line breaks he made a few line break assists he was running around those edges and and getting plenty of meters against the warriors particularly down the warriors left edge it felt was um quite vulnerable to some of that so that is a fascinating matchup ahead of uh ahead of next week's game for sure and that's where the Warriors have a lack of speed. Like I liked, I, I I actually really like Adam Pompey as a footy player. One weakness, he's not fast. Marcelo Montoya, he's not fast. Timothy Martin's not very fast. Mitchell Barnett, really good at rugby league, not necessarily a fast edge forward on that left edge. Hopefully, Olofiana Khan Pereira's on the other wing. Because if you've got <laughs> This is the thing about the Titans. They are they might be the fastest team in the NRL with Keanu Kinney, Khan Pereira, and those type of characters in their back line. That's a tough matchup for the Warriors. The Warriors are the better team, but they're not fast. They're a slower team, and the one thing the Storm uh, Titans have, Storm had it in spades as well, Storm with along yeah. they are fast. And uh Monday news that I did drop a, another update of my Tamaki Makoto versus Aotearoa State of Origin concept. And I've got Keanu Kinney on the bench for the Tamaki Makoto team. Other young players there, Dean Mariners on the wing, Matthew Tomoko's at centre, Nofahu White, I gave him a starting middle forward slot. And young players in Team Aotearoa, I went with Tain to our picky at fullback so I could get Joey Mano in the heart in the centers. Rocco Berry is one of my centers there. And obviously Team Aotearoa, no shortage of big boppers. Starting middle forwards, Fisher Harris, Tarpane, Asafa Salomona. Coming off the bench, you got Leo Thompson, Griffin Neem, and Xavier Willison, which is crazy. Shout out to your Dragons. They had a loss to the Sea Eagles this week. That would have been fun to watch. And again, going back to the theme of the podcast and some of the players mentioned in that uh, Tamaki Makoto versus Aotearoa update. So it's, it goes beyond the Warriors, right? Like the young Kiwi NRL players in Australia are fabulous. Keanu Kinney, Dean Mariner. Griffin Neem, Xavier Willison, Leo Thompson. Didn't get Will Warbrick for the Storm, but he's pretty damn impressive himself. There's a lot of young talent over in Australia on the Kiwi NRL side of things, and the Warriors have a lot of young talent coming through their pipeline. NBL basketball, tying it in with Tall Blacks basketball. We had a Tall Blacks squad update, Dan Fotu has been called into the crew. He's replacing our favorite basketballer, 
Hiram Harris, who wasn't playing in that Wellington Saints versus Franklin Bulls game. He's out injured, so he won't be with the Tall Blacks. He's been replaced by Dan Fotu. What do you... You got any takeaways, any insights there with the Tall Black squad? And why isn't Tane Samuel there? Well, Tane Samuel's not there because they got... Um, where Where's my list here of all the of the updated squad? They've got, you know, guys who can play power forward slash center. Ben Delaney on a, at his stretch. Um, a bit more of a power forward type, but... Tyrell Harrison is there. Ben Gold is there. Uh, he's a power forward as well. But uh, Tom Vodanovic would be competing. Sam Wardenberg certainly competing in that spot. Yanni Wetzel competing in that squad. It just happens to be that um, guys who do what Tane Samuel does, there's quite a few of them. Uh, that is an area of good depth for the for the Tall Blacks. Wings less so, but um, skilled big men... Absolutely. Like there's a lot of those and there's a lot more in contention. And, you know, like Sam Menango would, would have been someone, uh, I think he was in the, what do you call them? The sort of, it's not like non-traveling reserves, but it's like the extended squad who are like, these are your designated players you can call from if someone gets injured, which is what's happened for Dan Fortu, who's probably also in that bracket uh, as a power forward the same thing there is like he's been called up from that i was looking at those players i think tane murray taylor Britt. um uh he wrote it down but i can't remember who else was on that list but there's they had a they had a few options as to who they might go but dan Fotter was definitely the the closest thing to a like for like replacement for hiram harris in that tall black squad so that's what happened um the full squad is Flynn Cameron, Finn Delaney, Dan Fortu, Ben Gold, Tyrell Harrison, Shaley, Isaiah Liafa, Jordan Nata, Ethan Rosbach, Ruben Tarangi, Tom Vodanovic, Sam Wardenberg, Corey Webster, and Yanni Wetzel. Those are the blokes who are going to go out there and beat Luka Doncic. Uh, probably have to beat Giannis Antetokounmpo, which I'm sure they'll do in the in the knockouts. And yeah, win the tournament to get themselves a spot at Paris 2024. This is Olympic qualifying and... It's the yeah, it's it's not going to be easy. There's only a couple spots left, and there's a lot of good basketball teams around the world. But the Tall Blacks always put up a show, so um, them's the lads that are going to go and do the job. Was that Franklin versus Wellington game the key headline act of the weekend in NBA basketball, or was there something more interesting than that outing? Uh, for me, it probably was. Uh, I think that was a really interesting game for a couple of reasons because, A, you've got a lot of these dudes now disappearing. Like, those, those tall blacks I just listed are obviously off to... Uh, this week, the, the Olympic qualifying is at the start of next month, but they're going early so they can play a couple friendly games in Finland first as sort of like a training camp leading into it, keep everyone fresh and ready. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that game against uh well, well who else was no nah, like auckland had a big win canterbury had a big win keep them going but yeah that um saints franklin was kind of fascinating from the start because remember franklin were really good at the beginning they were one of the early leaders and then maybe they lost a bit of momentum or something or maybe they're just the the schedule balanced out a little bit i don't know but sort of felt like uh, the Tuatara stretch ahead and and found distance, and then Canterbury have actually caught them up. Wellington have stumbled a little bit because of Harris's injury more than anything, and Liafa missed a couple games as well. Um, they've been a little bit rotating their import stuff as well, but it just kind of felt like Franklin found themselves in a spot where they were flying under the radar, and part of that is because they played a couple of those other contending teams and lost, so that's always going to um, douse the flames a little bit, but they they needed a win here. I think they needed a statement win against one of those top half of the table teams just to show like, well, hold on a second, you know, don't forget about us. And they got that in, in overtime against the Saints. Saints team that does seem to be dropping a few lately. Like, Liafa went nuts in this game, scored 35 points, but, and I according to this, he's played 45 minutes, as did Ben Eyre, which I guess means they played the entire 40 minutes plus five minutes of overtime, which <laughs> took two to play the whole game. Um, 
fair enough if you can but i don't remember him scoring in the overtime period like it was a it might be a fatigue thing or it might just be franklin's quite a good defensive team and we're able to take away his three-point shot in particular um and yeah it was a it was just a, a grueling game where both teams probably needed a win because Wellington are going to be quite bad. Wellington are already stuttering with Harris missing. Well, Leaf is about to go and join the Tall Blacks. I don't think, no, um, Tana, uh, Toy Smith Milner is not. So they'll still have him around. But Leaf has been pretty crucial to how they've been playing. So it wouldn't be a surprise if they, like, he'll be back by finals times. But there's seeding that goes ahead before finals. And if he's missing a couple games, that's a. Uh, it's a bit of a factor for a Saints team that have now dropped to fifth. I don't think they'll drop any lower than that, but it probably stops them from being able to make a push to finish higher than that. Uh, Franklin are up to fourth. Auckland are the most affected team because they've got uh, Vodanovic and Tarangi and Webster all in that tall black squad. But the thing in their favor is that they've already had their double game week um, rounds. So they've played 16 games. Some other teams have only played, uh, well, Franklin have only played 14. Most other teams are on 15. So they won't at least, like they've at least got a few of their extra games out of the way with, so they won't miss quite as many uh, without those dudes. But that is still going to be a time where it, it'll, it'll be interesting there because Auckland, I think, have quite a quite a tasty set of sort of like local up and coming type players who we might not quite know yet but they tend to have a few like they tend to be pretty good at scouting the best kind of high school players so maybe some of those guys will get some opportunities over the next couple of weeks that they won't otherwise have gotten but yeah big big one for franklin there puts them back in the mix i, I reckon and probably not for top two but they'll be they'll be challenging taranaki for for third i would imagine taranaki have played one extra game and they won that extra game so franklin can catch up to them by winning their game in hand and taranaki of course don't have flynn cameron for the next couple rounds who was quite an important player for them so how will some of these teams handle the next couple weeks with those tall blacks missing going to be pretty fascinating because that's that's how that's how playoff seedings is going to be determined really who are your like best or favorite players who are going to be playing in the nbl who aren't in that tall black squad new zealand players only um well Carlin davison's been in some lovely touch lately he, he'll be one who i'd imagine will get a bit more um and tobias cameron probably as well get a bit more prominence for for taranaki since i'm just talking about them um without Flynn Cameron I yeah I don't know Taylor Brett will still be hanging around I guess you're looking at some of those guys who were on the fringes of that tall black squad but didn't quite make the cut Taylor Brett being one of them uh Toy Smith Milner would be another one um uh who who's left for or, well Rob Lowe is still going because he's retired of course from tall black duty so he'll be still hanging around getting gains for Auckland um yeah it's I don't know there's a the we're only taking 12 players out of the mix, so there's still plenty to go around for, for everyone else. I think I think Canterbury are a bit of a um they're they're a little bit of a what do you call it? Um they've, they've been fortunate by how this has broken down because Taylor Britt didn't get selected. I don't think they've lost anyone looking at that. Uh they have not. So that is you know the team that's on in i think it's 11 12 game win streak whatever they were up to now top of the table the four teams directly below them who seem to be contending have all lost at least one player they haven't been a, they haven't been touched by this i think that's a very good uh the things are broken nicely for the canterbury rams there beauty it will be very interesting to see which kiwi players step up over the next couple of weeks and whether the canterbury can double down on their advantage in the nbl that is the niche cast for today stay tuned for our subscriber podcast later in the week big up the patreon whanau and everyone supporting our mahi stay beautiful kia kaha chur, chur.